Hello, Mr Smith. I'm Dr McDonald. Nice Hi, to Dr. meet you. McDonald. We've not met before, but I work for the team who's looking after you, and uh, my consultants asked me to come and talk to you before you go home. Right. Can I just work out how much you understand about what tests we've done since you've come in and why you came in and so on? Um, well, I had a bit of a dizzy spell, um, so I came into hospital and um, I've had a CT scan. Right. And... Um, I think I'm about to go home, am I not? That's right. Did someone explain to you the results of the scan? or um, well, that you didn't really okay. find anything. So. That's right, so that's good news. So we didn't yeah. see anything abnormal on the scan. Um, the um, neurologist, as you know, came to see you and um, heard the story um, that came via your son second-hand about um, after you, the moment you lost consciousness. I understand you don't remember much about that. Is that no, right? of course not. And I think the concern is because your son reported you being twitchy and moving your arms around, that you might have had a fit or a seizure of some sort. I think the neurologist probably mentioned that to you. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's what he said, but he's only a kid, so... Sure. Um, I think that this is um, a difficult area. The, it's very pleasing that the scan is normal, but the CT scan has a limited ability to see very small things. Right. And what we want to do is do a more detailed scan. Um, at a later date to make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, there's another test that the neurologist wants to do which is called an EEG, which is a bit like the heart tracing you had when you came into hospital, but they put the electrodes on the head yeah, right. and, and do a tracing. And um, I don't know if the neurologist mentioned this to you, but I think what they're really keen to exclude is epilepsy. Was that a, a word he used or a diagnosis he mentioned? Um, no, not, not really. I mean, he did mention that it could be a possibility, but we didn't really go into it in much detail. So. Okay. Um, the um, diagnosis of epilepsy is, as I said, a difficult one to make. It's a, what we call a clinical diagnosis, so there's no one test we can do to establish it. We can't do a blood test and say you do or don't have it. We can't do a scan and say you do or don't have it. We have to take an overall clinical picture and make that judgment. And, right. and the person who makes that judgment ultimately is the neurologist who's met you. And I think at the moment he's, he's just not got enough information to do that. Um, so it's very pleasing that since this has happened, it's not happened again. Yeah. And the neurologist thinks for now you don't need to be on any medications in case it happens again, because he's not sure that the diagnosis is epilepsy. Um, as you know, you can have a faint or all sorts of other causes of, of, of losing consciousness for a moment. Um, but there are a few things before we get around to doing the tests and hopefully reaching a concrete diagnosis that, that I should talk to you about today, which my consultant is keen for me to discuss with you. And the first one really is that, um, as you can imagine, it's quite dangerous having a, a sudden loss of consciousness unexpectedly. And so it's very important before we go home that you understand there are a few things that you shouldn't do. Um, and really that's anything that's... Um, you're doing operating machinery in a situation where if you lost consciousness suddenly, um, your life would be in danger or you could be at risk of injuring yourself or others. Mm. So, for example, going swimming would be very unwise because you could suddenly lose consciousness and drown. Riding a bike would be unwise as well. Um, but the main thing I want to talk to you about before you go home is driving um, because the, um, there's obviously a risk if you're behind a wheel and this happens again Mm. that you could lose control of the car and either hurt yourself or your passenger, if it's your son or someone else on the street. Has right. someone mentioned that to you before? No, they haven't actually, um, but there's, there's just no way that I can't drive, so I've just right. got to, it's my, it's my livelihood. So. Right, yes, I understood from the notes you were a taxi driver. Yeah, and, um, yeah, uh, I'm just doing that because I'm studying law, so um, there's no way I can't drive. Right. How are things financially? Would it be a major financial Huge, yeah. problem? I can't afford to pay my mortgage if I don't drive, you know, you know yourself, you have a job, sure. um, so that's just not an option. Right. Um, I think the important thing is that we have, we see a lot of people in this situation and it's obviously very, it's a big shock for something like this to happen. Well, it's not a big shock, it's just I just had a dizzy spell, that's all, you've just, you've done a scan, I'm fine. You didn't find anything, so I can go my merry way and get, get on with my life, can't I? Um, the problem when these things come out of the blue and then you feel better afterwards and you have no memory of them before is that um, it, um, you can often feel completely well if you have an, a disorder that yeah, can do that fine. in between episodes, but they can come very, very suddenly without warning. Um, and um, I've seen a lot of people in your situation before who felt completely well 
and um, they've gone out and it's happened again, mostly in, in circumstances where they won't do themselves or other people harm. But the great risk is that it might happen at a time when you're, you're doing something, you're driving your taxi with a passenger or driving your son around, for example. Of course, I think the consequences, if it did happen, although it's unlikely, the consequences would be really devastating. Mm, I suppose if you said it's, you know, it's un unlikely, there's nothing, you know, what else can I do? I need to, I need to have an income, so... Um, the, um, the issue with the driving, especially as a taxi driver professionally, is that um, when something like ha this happens, and yes, yes, you could argue that anyone is at risk of having their first fit driving around without a previous diagnosis at any time. But having had one episode that sounds quite like one, we need to confirm it and we need to do more tests. Well, can we just you know, our... be clear here? Because, you know, an, an eight-year-old boy witnessed that I had some sort of dizzy spell. You know, yeah. you're getting your information from him. Yeah. And he's, he's a child, you know, he probably freaked out. Mm. So... I'm fine, I feel fine, yeah. and I need to, I, I need to, I mean, I'm wasting my time sitting here talking to you, to be honest with you, Dr. McDonald or whatever, I need to, you know, I need to be getting on, I've got, you know, I've got to pick my boy up from, from my mum's, mm. I haven't got, I haven't got the time to be sort of chatting through the, you know, unlikely scenarios. Yeah. I'm sorry no one's discussed this with you before, or raised the issue before, it. It is unlikely, but it's much more likely to happen to you than it is to anyone else, and that's what we're worried about. And the, the key thing is to reach a diagnosis as soon as we can so that we can work out whether this is something you're not going to be able to do for a long time or hopefully a short time. And the best strategy is to involve as many experts as possible. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the neurologist to reach a diagnosis as soon as possible. But it's also important that we involve... Um, so how long is it going to take to get this diagnosis then? Well, the diagnosis, I'll come to that in just a moment. The, but what, it's, it's also important that you, because as a taxi driver you have a licence, you have insurance and so on and so forth, from, from a moment something like this happens, that's invalid until you've seen a professional who said you're, you're okay to drive. And that's partly your neurologist, your specialist, and we'll talk about getting the diagnosis and the investigations done for that. But it's also the DVLA, who are the licensing authority, who regulate these things. And they have very specific tests that they need someone like you as a taxi driver to go through before your license can be reinstated. Now, they don't know what's happened at the moment, well, but it's, it is your duty to inform them of that and inform them that your doctors are concerned that you've had an episode where you've lost consciousness. Now... I know that has major financial repercussions for you, but we can do everything we can to try and minimise those. So in the first instance, as you mentioned about the investigations, we'll try and get them done as soon as possible. The waiting list for these scans... Waiting list as well, you see? I mean, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So you're saying I've got to inform the DVLA, say that I'm not driving, when... I don't, where's my money going to come from? Are you going to pay then? So While I'm waiting, you're going to give me my weekly income. Is that what's going to happen? When you go home, we'll give you a discharge summary with all the information. We can also contact your GP directly, and we can we can work out some form of income support while you're not getting income from your taxi driving, and we can make sure that any benefits you'd be eligible for because of this, you'll get. How yeah. how long is this going to take then? Because to be honest, you know I I know about benefits, and I'm not going to be getting anywhere near my salary, am I? I How am I going to pay for my mortgage? Is this how, what is it going to go on for? Like two years waiting list? Is that it with the NHS we're, these we're not days? Talking I don't... Years at all. We're talking at the most weeks to wait for all these tests and get the appointment with the neurologist to see it. Right. So if I just so wait it's... here, if I just wait here, we can get it done quicker. There is no need then to inform the DVLA. There's. I'll just. I'll just stay here in the hospital then. Well, stay actually, well. the um, the unusual thing about these waiting lists is actually quicker to be done as outpatients than they are as inpatients. Oh so... come on. I don't believe that for a second. The way that the service is organised... I know what uh, you're like with your beds. I'm staying here. The, um, that's one option for you, but I think that the problem is that um, you um, wouldn't be able to get things done any faster. As an outpatient, the waiting list for these tests is shorter, which is why we've gone down this route to try and get them as soon as possible. And the EEG is not provided in this hospital as an inpatient oh, service, isn't it? so it has to be done as an outpatient. And I think the neurologist needs to get as much information as possible as soon as possible. So what we'll try and do is get those done as soon as we can. And ringing up and getting these things pushed forward can make a lot of difference with those things. 
And in the meantime, we can make sure your GP knows enough so that he can get you as much financial support as possible. But we are talking at the most weeks and probably two weeks at the most before we can get all your tests done. So we're not talking months waiting for these to be done. But I have to say that if those tests do show or do suggest that there is an abnormality on the scan or that, um, that there's a, an increased chance that you might have epilepsy, then that might mean that you won't be able to drive for the long term. So I think, I know that's really bad news, but I think this is just what's happened and it might be the case that this is your first seizure and we might have to start thinking about other ways of making money um, while you're doing your studies other than this. What we're going to try and do is, you know, I know you feel like you've been here for 24 hours or so, you've had a couple of tests and we're sending you out without any clear diagnosis, you're not on any treatment, you don't know what's going on, and all we've done is told you that you can't drive and you can't do anything else. But um, what, we, what we hope we can provide is a lot of support throughout that. So we're going to try and get your clinic done as soon as possible, your test done as soon as possible, we're going to make sure your GP's fully in the picture to help you um, financially if, you're, if you don't have an income during this time. Okay, and we're going to make a really clear plan about how that's going to happen. If things aren't happening fast enough, we'll speed them up. Right. Can I just let you understand about what you have to do with regard to the DVLA when you get home? Well, I mean, to be honest, I don't think there's any point in contacting them until we know actually what the situation is. So, you know, I think I'm going to wait until I have these tests, we get the results, and then I'll deal with it as I need to then. Okay. Um, I think the, um, I have to be very clear that the, the law is very clear about um, if we've warned you that there's a risk that you might lose consciousness at the wheel or might drive, and then that happens, um, then um, you would be, all your insurance your, and so on would be completely invalid um, and you'd be legally culpable for that. And it's not our duty to inform the DVLA directly that we've warned you about this, but it's your responsibility. And, um, the but if, I, if I'm not on the road for the next couple of weeks while these tests are being done, then surely that's fine. And then if it comes to the point, which it won't, but if it does, then I can inform them that, you know, I've got epilepsy or whatever it is, and, and we'll go from there, surely. OK, I think that um, the reason it's important to involve them at an early stage is this, if, you, if you were to inform them, say, in two weeks' time and say... Um, I've had these tests and they've shown that I might have epilepsy. Um, the DVLA um, would, um, I think, have issues of concern about the fact that they hadn't been alerted prior to that. And that might affect whether or not they reinstate your licence, whether or not the outcome was you have a seizure disorder or not. Do you see what I mean? So I think the best strategy is to inform them right from the start. And they, their tests change all the time. They have specialists who they involve in, in determining whether you're fit to drive or not. And I think getting their advice and help, they're a very supportive organisation, is the best strategy. And I'm sorry it's such bad news. I mean, this is awful. This is your income. This is um, um, the way you finance your studies and look after your son. Yeah. And, and I think that's why, and I'm sorry no one's mentioned it before, what repercussions it has when you potentially lose consciousness. But it's, as, I know, as I'm sure you understand things could be a whole lot worse. You could have lost consciousness at the wheel rather than in front of the TV when you were with your yeah. son. And we could be having an entirely different conversation about um, you know, much more serious consequences. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened, but we must do everything we can to make sure it doesn't. And um, I know the risk may seem low, but it's certainly higher than the general population's risk, and the consequences are really devastating, and we've seen that happen. So um, what we'll do is we'll give you a discharge summary to take to your GP. Right. Um, and on that we'll make it very clear that you're going to need some form of income support while you're going through this diagnostic process. I'll do my best to get all the tests done as soon as possible. And then you'll have the expert opinion of the neurologist. But I would encourage you to go to DVLA and report what's happened and get their help right from the start. All right, thank you. So in the ethics and communication scenario stations, the 
Examiners will give you a scenario before you meet the actor or the patient. And it's very important you take some time to try and work out not only what information they've asked you to convey, but what information the patient has to understand before they'll be able to receive that information. So it's important to first of all build a foundation of understanding before you can then build on top of that and by conveying the information you're supposed to. For example, in this scenario, the foundation that the patient needs to grasp is that what's happened to them is potentially very dangerous. As it happens, the seizure happened in front of the TV and no harm came to her. But in reality, if it happened when she was driving a taxi, the consequences could have been devastating, or if she had her son in the car. So before you leap in and talk about having to inform the DVLA, it's essential that they understand what's happened is potentially very dangerous indeed. Once you've done that, you can then talk about the consequences, what they need to avoid. So avoid situations in which they'll be vulnerable. And then you can lead up to the issue of driving, which is obviously going to be an explosive issue in this case, because she's a taxi driver and this is her source of income. But unless you've built some sort of foundation of understanding and made sure she's understood that the risks are very high, it's very difficult to reach that point um, without causing um, a competitive confrontational situation. Another key thing to remember is that the communication skills and the history-taking skills are separate stations. It's very, in, very easy to get drawn into doing one when you're sitting and being examined for the other. In this case, there's some sort of ambiguity over the history. Her seizure was witnessed by her son. It's unclear whether or not she's got epilepsy. And it would be very easy for the actor or the patient to draw you into a discussion about the security of the diagnosis. And this must be avoided in this scenario at all costs. She's been seen by a specialist, a neurologist, who's given his advice about what needs to be done. And that's what you should stick to. Um, try not to get um, drawn into a history-taking scenario. Along similar lines, it's important not to be confrontational. Ultimately, it's your duty to inform the DVLA if you think she's still driving, despite the advice you've given. But to mention that in the consultation would be explosive, once again. The challenge of this consultation is to persuade the patient to take on your risk management assess assessment of the situation. So they have to appreciate the potentially devastating consequences and the increased risk of them occurring. And that's what you'll be assessed on, your ability to convey that to the patient and reach agreement over that. The last important point is that it's, in, it's crucial to end on a positive note and to make a plan and to seem supportive. Um, to merely say that you can't drive and you can't and your livelihood's going to be taken away for a while is insufficient. And examiners will expect you to be empathic and supportive. And in this case, that means speeding up the investigations as much as possible and um, making sure the GP understands the situation so that if she's eligible for any financial support, that's available.